So hi, everybody. Um, you're very welcome to tonight's launch. Uh, there are still a few more people trickling in, but um, I think we're going to kick off and uh, they can join us as they, as they come in. So thank you so much uh, to all of you for joining us to celebrate the launch of these three wonderful new pamphlets. I should hold them up really, make more sense. There we are. Uh, if you haven't got a copy, this is what they look like. Um, they are pamphlets by Katie Byford, Fatima Zara and Zain Sadadin. Uh, my name is Neil Munro. I'm the director of the Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre where Ignition Press is housed. Um, I should say before we kick off that in the interest of accessibility we'll be sharing the poems um, as they're being read by the three poets and closed captioning is also available. Um, you may or may not be able to currently see it. If you want to use it, uh, just go to the bottom of your screen and click on the little link there. Um, Zoom closed captioning, some of you may know, is not bad, uh, but it is also not amazing. Um, and so it's going to uh, seriously struggle um, with anybody's name, uh, anything to do with Greek myth, and any words from languages that aren't English, uh, which means it's going to produce some surprising, possibly outlandish results uh, this evening, and possibly some unhelpful and hilarious interpretations. You can probably see them going through already. Um, so I hope you'll just bear with us uh, with those. It could be really helpful for people, obviously, uh, but it's not perfect. Um, so the format this evening, uh, I'll say a few words about the press and the centre, um, and then each editor uh, will give a short introduction to each poet. So I've been working with Katie, uh, my colleague Claire Cox, also herself a poet, uh, has been Zara's editor, and our managing editor of the press, Les Robinson, has been working with Zane, so he'll do an introduction to her. Um, the poets will then read for about 15 minutes each before we wrap up, hopefully by uh, around eight o'clock. So, as I said, the press is located um, at Oxford Brooks Poetry Centre, which some of you may know is itself based in the School of English and Modern Languages at Oxford Brooks University. Here we conduct research, lots of different research, into a very wide range of poetry, and we teach poetry as well, uh, both um, about it um, and also how to write it in our creative writing programmes, which we have both at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. And if you're interested in that at all, just search on the Oxford Brooks website. We also run an international poetry competition, some of you may know, uh, which is currently open for entries, in fact. Uh, any poet anywhere in the world is very welcome to enter, and our judge this year is the rather brilliant and acclaimed poet Will Harris. There are two categories, open and English as an additional language, um, and winners in both categories receive a thousand pounds. So if you're interested, if you're a poet and you're interested in that kind of thing, then please do check it out. Again, just have a look on our website uh, for more details. Uh, you can find lots more about the general activities of the uh, Poetry Centre on the website. And if you're not already following us on social media, uh, do track us down. We are at Brooks Poetry, that's B-R-O-O-K-E-S Poetry, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, which one day I will learn how to use properly. Um, Ignition Press was established in 2017 uh, with the aim of being a press with an international outlook, which publishes original arresting poetry from emerging poets. We've now published 17 pamphlets, including the ones this evening, and three of those are Hurry of English by Mary Jean Chan, Hinge by Alicia Pia Muhammad, and Ripe by Isabel Baffey, uh, have been selected as Poetry Book Society pamphlet choices. Alicia's pamphlet uh, was also shortlisted for the Michael Marks Award for Poetry last year and was only beaten, in fact, in second place by Paul Muldoon, uh, the scoundrel. Um, you can buy all the pamphlets uh, that we remain in print, including, of course, the ones this evening um, by Katie, Zara and Zane um, via the online shop. And I've just put a link to that in the chat and I'll, I'll put another one in a minute. Um, or you can just look up the Poetry Centre website. We'll post them out to you uh, as soon as we can. Before I introduce Katie and uh, you can hear her read, I'm going to thank several people who have made the pamphlets and the launch possible. So huge thanks to our colleague Lucinda Fru for looking after the online shop to Simon Froud and his colleagues at Seacourt uh, who printed the pamphlets. Uh, we're also very grateful to Flora Hands, who is based at Carline Creative, who designs our covers, um, and to Luke Allen of Studio Le Monde, who is a fantastic typesetter, really brilliant, and he's also an excellent poet. Finally, I just want to say a huge thanks to, to my fellow editors, Claire Cox and Les Robinson, whose dedication to the press and the Poetry Centre more generally uh, has made my job a lot easier and more enjoyable, and it's enabled the press to thrive. Um, at Ignition Press, we make a, a real point of working closely with our poets from the initial stage uh, of their selection right through to quite an intense, I think, editing process through to publication and beyond. So thank you very much to Claire and Les for their continuing commitment to the project. 
Uh, and many, many congratulations uh, to the poets. Uh, it's been a real privilege to work with them. Um, and it's a real privilege for us to po publish your poetry. Even though this is an online launch, uh, I hope you'll enjoy reading um, to what I'm sure will be a, a supportive audience. As I say, if you have any comments, um, please add them to the chat as we go along. Um, I also want to say thanks to all the friends and family who supported these poets. Uh, and poet, being a, a poet um, is, a, is always a kind of tricky um, sort of thing to do. It's always trying to, you think you're kind of sending out poems, you're never sure if somebody's going to read them. Um, and it really helps if you have the support of friends and family. So thank you very much to a lot of you, I'm sure, uh, who are here this evening. We are recording this event, but because it's a webinar, we aren't recording you, we're just recording the poets and the editors. And uh, whilst right now your chat can be seen by everybody, uh, after the event, we'll only share it with the poets. Um, so don't worry about that. Uh, we hope to make the recording available later on. So if you know anybody who's missed it, who wanted to attend, uh, email me or get them to email me and I'll, I'll try and make it available to them. So I hope you enjoy the readings and thank you so much again for joining us. I'm going to introduce Katie. Um, I was really lucky to be Katie's editor. I, I feel very fortunate about that. Working with her has been a real pleasure. Um, as she has, as you'll hear and as you'll see, a marvellous eye for detail. Um, it's no surprise, perhaps, given uh, her expertise in filmmaking as well as in writing. And her pamphlet, He Said I Was a Peach, um, includes poems that offer intricate, subtle, sometimes devastating engagements with topics which are very urgent in our world. The pamphlet is partly grounded in Greek myth, but as you'll hear, the work transcends myth. Um, has a profound grasp of what is real and what is possible, and it speaks directly to concerns with gender, toxic masculinity, the abuse of women, and trauma that can result from that. Uh, it shuttles deftly between past and present, uh, between imagery that is difficult and uncomfortable, and that which is whimsical and humorous. As the poet Fiona Benson has written in comments that appear on the back of Katie's pamphlet, in fact, there is a beautiful act of salvage here, she writes. So it's not all darkness, believe me. Uh, and the journey that we go on through the pamphlet ends with two poems of ferocious optimism. As the speaker asks, what does she do next? I'll be very excited to see what Katie does do next. Uh, but for now, I hope you enjoy listening to her read some of these strange, really captivating poems. Many congratulations, Katie. Uh, over to you. I will just share your poems so everybody can see what you're reading. Hello, um, I hope you can see me. I don't know if you can, but um, that was quite an introduction. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Niall. Um, I'll try and live up to it. Um, yeah, I'm so just so happy to be here this evening and thank you so much for everyone who's, um, yeah, who, who's tuned in and joined us. It's really lovely to have you. Um, I am going to start uh, with the um, poem that opens the pamphlet. Doesn't have a title. Standing close in the kitchen, teaching me how to tie knots in stems with your teeth and my tongue, cheek cold and smooth as flesh bitten, stones falling from lips licked clean glistening, dancing like two dangled stems pinched in teeth, tumbling onto the kitchen floor, flushed, skipping into the heart of the house, the gem in its chest, our fingers staining all the door frames red. Um, and uh, the next one is, um, uh, based on the myth of Persephone, um, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. Um, uh, Persephone is abducted um, by her uncle and dragged down to the underworld and um, betrothed to him. Um, that gets undone, but not fully, and she's forced to um, uh, remain under the ground half of the year forever. Um, and when she comes back up from the underworld that spring, um, this is a rewriting of that myth or a revisitation of that myth. <laughs> um, and uh, I won't go into it, but the first line is from Chaucer and kind of translates to it's better to be married 
um, than to burn. Appetite. Persephone meets her betrothed. Bet is to be wedded than to Bryn. He said I was a peach. Couldn't see him. Didn't know the crocus pollen on my toes would be a dowry. Black earth gulped my legs, my shoulders, covered my head, my footprints with itself. The taste of aquifers, stone forests, mantle. I am dead, I reasoned. Through dusted lashes, knelt somewhere, head bowed. Informed I am to be comfort for a mud king with strange pets. I gripped a grass blade, still bright with my own kissed breath. There was a wedding of sorts, my stomach and other parts surveyed to fathom my capacity, hung from my feet to siphon sunlight, blood pressed for foxglove poisons, panned for gold molecules. Then began the drinking, a feast of carrion. The maltworm king crowed his huge knowledge of human weakness. How fitting you are mine, he cracked, for the price of your hunger. How fitting he, the corpse lord, mistook silence for surrender and half sober stirs face down on his throne mound, bound under my foot, my heel in gray cheek flesh. And at my word, forfeits all but everything of his, even the dogs. So next, um, I believe we travel to Aulis. Um This is a, another myth um, that I've uh, uh, revisited. And yeah, I, I don't, I'm not going to say too much about it, actually, because um, uh, hopefully it kind of, you get something from it, even when you don't know anything about this myth. But um, yeah, uh, it's based on the kind of Clytemnestra, Agamemnon, um, that kind of myth cycle, if anyone's familiar with it. Postcard from Aulis. Clytemnestra draws a bath for her husband. I'm cutting loose. It's not worth it. I stay fast in the corner. I fixed on a map of the Greek resort, bunched up with the towels and cigarette butts. No windows or aircon, but at least it's somewhere different. You've been sunbathing with another girl, Doris or maybe Cloris. Two sets of bleached fluorescent teeth clicking together on the bathroom tiles. You shout at me, turn the tap off, not hot enough, hotter. I unbutton my shirt quietly. Cloris has a gull laugh. You fish up lager and sand from your stomach into the bowl, spit out a seashell, resume snogging. I thumb it idly then, this old note. One corner inching out from my bikini top the size of a playing card, folded and folded. The one you wrote me when our daughter wasn't dead yet. Your big vowels smudged, nervous. Dear Tess, picture it. A beach wedding for our little girl. It's roasting here. We're sweating daggers. Dress her up pretty. You'll see us at the altar. Party time. Some love letter. Your puckered fingers choke the faucet. Chloris pulls the plug, switches you off. 
excuses herself to the lavatory. I'm summoned and I come, gaze lowered. I am your girl. I rub sunscreen between your ribs. I run the water hot and salt and beachy and hold you under. So um, next for something totally different. Um, uh, I believe I'm reading, uh, it's weird having a preset. Uh, I'm usually a lot more, oh, I guess now I'll read this. Um, so it's nice to have a kind of, um, it's all laid out before me. So I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, uh, yeah, um, from from the, the Greek resort all the way back to, um, overpriced food in London. Um, this is fuck salad. We both live with our parents. So we meet in loud underground restaurants or bistros for expensive food and shouted conversation and talk nonsense about ex-lovers, how they kissed, why we left, Terrible men, wonderful women. We order cheese, claw at the tablecloth. We should be wrapped up in sheets, draped over ourselves like sea lions, smelling the other's hair, tangling with our own, half breathing. But instead we take turns describing the food we're eating. The room's too bright to fill with poetry or prayer too dim to see the details of your face. I can't spoon you, brush your hair across the table, over the bread basket. I can lick your knife and nothing else. I'll cock my head and after some rough clattering silence, offer you a bite of duck salad that you're paying for anyway, or entreat a nip from a glass stained with your lips, tilted gingerly by gentle fingers into an open mouth, a glimpse, quick rush of blood. I guard the memory of that taste in every nerve of me, saved like a crumb under the table, sanctified, sheltered behind the linen, but the meal foregone. Um, and I think finally, if I still have time, um, <laughs> I think this is the last one. Um, so it's been a pleasure uh, and thank you so much for, yeah, um, for coming and uh, being with us tonight. Um, this is Sun. Thetis remembers her mortal child, Achilles. A diving bell with an unhinged head is the best treat. Amid utter absence, the bones glow. Elvers and shark pups peck them dry. From that supper, some are quenched for an entire year, drag the floor with bellies full of tongue. But they aren't the only hungry. The threshold of hell sinks further, colder. A filthy bed, one enormous dune of undigested skin. The oldest, smallest creatures take up in me. I wake to their fond nips. I teem, create them in their need. Fill us up. I call for currents. Envoys set to burrow into land, divide and eat it. To dissolve beaches, pluck gables off their walls and swallow the contents and bear it hence to many little mouths. And yet, your voice, I can hear your voice. A warm strain softening the frozen kelp like piss. 
mixed with the grains from the sand that crusts your knee skin. The message has formed a bubble. It drifts down, down to my seat in the dark, ringing with the wet clatter of knives and limbs. You beg, I come. Say it's urgent. Please, Mum. I sigh, draw myself back into a single body, defer the ocean's vast appetites. For this naked whelp, my finite child, I rise in a pillar of silt, my chariot of anglerfish maidens. Fine. Let us begin your second lesson. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Katie. That was great. Uh, really compelling reading, uh, as always. Thank you so much. Um, right. OK, so I'll just put a link in there. If you want to find out more about uh, Katie's pamphlet, please check out the link. And if you want to buy a copy, you haven't already got one. And there's a link there to that as well. So I'm going to hand over now to Claire, Claire Cox, who was the editor of uh, Zorro's pamphlet. Uh, so Claire, over to you. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much, Neil, for that introduction. Um, I love this uh, auto-translate. I am now Claire Copps, uh, which I'm going to embrace. Claire Copps. Uh, I am so happy to be here this evening. It was a true delight to work with Zara. Um, we select, sort of blind, we get, um, uh, we get into a little huddle and read things uh, without names. And on the first reading, uh, I read the manuscript then and said, well, here is an outstanding poet. And then I thought, well, here is an outstanding poet with something profoundly important to say. And then I thought, here is an outstanding poet with something profoundly important to say. And she says it in ways that are both beautiful and unflinching. And that is a rare gift and one that um, Zara has in absolute buckets. So I'm very excited to be here to uh, uh, work with Zara uh, and also um, to have this fantastic pamphlet here in our hands. It's, it's always a joy when, when the work becomes real. So this is a treasure. So these poems that came through to the final selection sort of negotiate differing geographies and embodiments that influence growing up from girlhood to maturity. Um, working with Zara as an editor, I am just hugely impressed at her skill and at her remarkable facility for creating memorable moments in her, her writing. She is deft and quick and has a remarkable ear for language, uh, which comes out as clear yet loaded with so much more meaning than just the syllables contain. Um, these poems are equally at home on the page and the stage, again, another rare balance to, to achieve, and they radiate significance and effortly, effortlessly take on the most perfect form to convey an unmistakable presence in fresh and creative ways. So they are, there's all sorts of interesting things if you delve in in terms of format. Let me show you some. So there is no fear of the form and there is no fear of language here. So as a, as a reader, I'm intrigued and beguiled at what's being offered in these precious glimpses into a personal world that is alive with it as restriction and opportunity. The effect is mesmeric. I'm also, I'm so pleased Miriam is here tonight because I'm going to read Miriam Nash's endorsement that she can uh, hear all the way in Northern uh, Italy because it is um, perfect, really. Uh, in this stunning debut, Fatima Zara speaks to all of us for whom home is a shifting foundation. Rooted in the personal, the poems reach outward. You are every bridge that crosses the Thames and the people crossing it, they remind us forging connection even as they negotiate loneliness or fear. Tightly wrought, unafraid to leap, these poems are concerned with containment and dancing, tradition and resist them. resistance carry them close. I couldn't have said it better myself and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Zara for you. Hello everyone. Um, thank you for that beautiful introduction. And 
Uh, I can see so many familiar names here in the audience tonight, and I'm so touched. Um, so thank you all for coming, and thank you to my editor and the team at Ignition Press for your encouragement and patience throughout. Um, this first poem is Mahendi Ode. It's wedding season back home. I haven't been in four years, and one of the things that I miss is just getting together with my cousins and putting Mahendi on for each other, going outfit shopping, and whether it was a wedding or Eve, and this one's for them. Mahendi Ode. Last night, I drew some on again, craving the laughter of other women in the room, phone blaring the latest Bollywood songs, feeding each other geese sweets with our free hand. Oh, first teacher of patience, the slow drip of each second as I sink in my chair, eyes glued to my palms, waiting for the cool brown to crack. Oh, Muslim tattoo, oh, human etch-a-sketch. How everyone asks of it at Eidga, who did yours, which cone, how long? Each family's got their secret to turn it darker. Olive oil and cotton pads, lemon juice and sugar dabbed on after it dries. Oh, Chandrat and the long hours of cousins buzzing, copying designs from yellowed pages. They spin an R into arms dotted with flowers and paisley. Gossip leafed into each other's palms. The next poem I'll be reading is the title poem. It's named after the community events where I was growing up in Jeddah. The word Sargum is also one letter away from meaning heaven in Malayalam. Sargum, Swargum. I miss here my friend say she went to heaven for the weekend. How everyone was dancing all night. How her parents lost their frowns in the crowd. How there were string lights everywhere. I asked her why she left. I was six. God knows I don't still picture Jenna the way I did. Think of your classmate drowning in her best salmon pitch. You know, I'll bake you. Those come flying to you in heaven. There's never been a version of heaven that didn't hold my old life. Of date palms and Cornish picnics. Where the sun squeezed our headaches alive. Of all the things I said goodbye to. Loss slept in the house coated by sand, but I watched the world from a periscope, my days punctuated by the azan. I've downsized my dua since. They exchange outfits at the gates of heaven, croons the name of a boy, asks about a dead grandfather. Of all the heavens I've hoarded, I like the one with the flying boxes of fried chicken best. The one where the bouncers say salam. The next poem I'll be reading is Brown Girl's Anthem. It's a golden shovel after a line um, from the movie Call Me By Your Name. Brown Girl's Anthem. We die so many deaths before we turn 20. We, the schoolyard Kardashians, we sue our stories, rip them out as the school, school bus pulls up at our door. We cast out our wild tongues so the aunties won't. Scrape it so they don't know where to look for nipped butts. So much is lost in undoing shame. 
before we learned glory. We talked of our love lives to walls. History didn't erase us. We did it ourselves. The next poem is called Tortil. Um, it's a Malayalam word which refers to like a traditional cradle made of cloth. And it's a tribute to some of the places that I grew up in. Tortil. One. We made dupatta forts in the living room. My siblings trailing after each other as we escaped forests from grim stories. Friday mornings donated to the TV. The apartment on the first floor in the sand-coated building shrunk around us as we sprouted inches. Wanted corners to name after ourselves. Friends crunch their noses when they walk into the room that once held the four of us and all our stuffed toys. Two. I spend my weekends throwing up in the bathroom with the white tiles and frosted glass door. Pizza and blue pills that were supposed to help, all swirling. This was the price of living alone, I thought, sinking to the floor for comfort. Each night I carried remnants of my day into sleep. A midnight drive to the mountains, an imagined kiss, cries stifled by the pillow. The bed grows heavy with my secrets. Mum doesn't recognize me when she flies down to deliver me from my madness. Three. I remember an abandoned runway in the middle of our flat. Gray walls and tiles I learned to walk on. Most of it I owe to speckled photographs. Mum's retellings of how she'd be on her knees, scraping the dirt off the floor. How she'd watch me snatch dolls away from my first best friend or take them apart. I wince at every mention of my night long crying and daylight turning. I can almost see her switching arms between each rocking, pulling the cradle towards her before letting go. This next poem is called Initiation. Every girl remembers her first. Mine, all black with white satin at the sleeves. I wore it to four prayers nestled between my parents, mouthing words and looking all serious for God. I knew the patterns of my mum's abayas, black sequins, lace and thread at the hem that I lose sight of at supermarkets until I look up to find a stranger. Mum's face sheet white, calling my name across the floor. I grow into mine before I know it. Buy an abaya for each season. Pretend I don't hear it shout to the world I'm a woman. My friends and I strut and compare each other's in the school grounds. Try on our mums when no one looks. Pretend they fit. When I leave, I stuff it into the suitcase already bursting. Pull it out last minute. Fill the trash bag instead. This next poem is called Kurbani. Auntie prayed for sheep, but was gifted a daughter watches her grow with reproach, calls her home before Maghrib, threatens to send her to boarding school if she doesn't keep her head down or stay quiet, interrogates her about a boy at the bus stand the neighbor saw her with, changes schools when the uniform's too short for her liking, 
At 21, Auntie starts looking for bearded men to herd her home. She doesn't have to search for long. She's been hoarding gold since her first birthday. When Auntie calls home, she gloats about her son-in-law one month into the marriage. How he asks his wife to dress in white. How he keeps her safe within four walls. How he's taught her to bleed. So I grew up between Jeddah and India before eventually going to England. And this is one of the earliest poems I wrote, thinking about, I think the loss, but also the multiple homes some of us carry. Suitcase. Here's to the ones that waltz into this world with suitcases. The ones who learned early to pack all their memories, goodbyes, and clothes into 23 kilograms and cabin baggage. You are a dossier of every last place you fell in love with. You are the Lebanese diner next to the first house that watched you grow. You are the rickety swing in the backyard of your granddad's house in Parur. You are every bridge across Thames and the people crossing it. You, with your hummus-loving heart and dancing tongue that lift, twist, and settle three languages, but trembles at any mention of home, bait, cut. Here's your suitcase with every last goodbye from friends that are now a thumbtack on a world map. Here are your dreams, a compass, your parents' prayers, a life west. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Zara. Really, uh, again, really, really compelling reading. It's uh, wonderful to hear them read out loud. Thank you. Uh, right over to Les to introduce uh, last poet this evening, uh, Zane. Hi, Dave. Thanks, Neil. Um, very great to hear the, the other two poets in this batch of Mission Press and um, really well read. Um, I do, in the editing process, I do miss the face to face meetings with poets, spreading poems out across the table, sharing a coffee or a glass of wine. Um, and Zane and I have never actually met officially, but we have been in the same room because she attended our first Ignition Press launch at St Andrews in April 2018 with Lily, Patrick and Mary Jean. And that does seem such a long, long time ago for many, many reasons. As some of you know, uh, it takes a lot to get me excited about poetry, but Staircase is an extraordinary debut from an extremely accomplished and confident poet who works diligently with her craft. And yes, there can still be originality in poetry. Throughout the pamphlet, Zayn weaves her cultural influences through the poems, using Arabic script to underline their many layered textures. As an example, I point to the sequence, the is searching for a pair of eyes, which is particularly engaging, challenging tradition, and overall very rewarding. And the only way you'll find out about that is obviously buying copies of the pamphlets. So um, you need to get online to do that. Zane was brilliant to work with, and even in my 70s, I've been able to learn from her. A hint of Arabic, a taste of her culture, a touch of Arabese, and something of a man of Jordan. And to finish, before Zane reads, I want to quote from Lane's testimonial. These poems travel up towards turquoise mornings and down into the Roman ruins and crowded spaces of an ancient city as it changes. A city that gazes towards whatever else is west of itself. Looking forward to hearing Zane Lee, so um, thank you. Thank you, Len, that was so nice. Um, and I'm not sure if that was a slight dig at an interview that came out yesterday where I said that I don't think there's anything such as originality in writing. <laughs> but uh, thank you, that really does mean so much. And thank you 
to Ignition Press and to everyone here. Um, these poems mean a lot to me and I'm so lucky that um, everyone at Ignition Press cares about them as much as I did and sort of trusted them and trusted me. Um, and it's been so lovely to hear uh, Katie and Zara read. It's been so nice. So um, yeah, uh, so this is the pamphlet. I'm gonna start off by reading um, a poem called The Sea is the Most Flexible of Things. And that Arabic script there, for those who don't read Arabic, um, is taken from the Holy Quran and it translates to, and we've created out of water everything that lives. So how do they not believe? Um, and that's a verse from the Quran. So this is, the sea is the most flexible of things. In quiet corners, I think of all the things I do not think of. Gatekeeper of thoughts, tonight, oddly, the moon is brutal, nonchalant. Be the comfort of its carelessness, I name three good things. Rahim, the presence of water. Second, the hand of Fatima. Third, Wa'akhiran, cardamom. I take note of these from the sky like a schoolgirl. Sadaqallah al-Azim. When the ampersand of time moves forward like a hiccup, drawing itself into history, otherwise known as the east border of my country, I know I am damned, damned, damned for all things, like favoring sunflower seeds in particular. A true Arab, I am, I think, a culmination of apes protruding like balconies over the city. I watch our superstitions change accordingly. What a sight, mashallah. How little us mud things have to offer. So that was the sea is the most flexible of things. You'll see a lot of seas and moons in my poems, um, which Les and I talked about quite a lot in, my, in the editing process. Uh, so next, I wanna read a poem from the point of view of the moon. Um, and that tonight Al-Qamar writes a sonnet and Al-Qamar is Arabic for the moon. Tonight Al-Qamar writes a sonnet. Ooh, the rivers in my house burn alive. They wave their hands, salam, then goodbye. But Al-Bayt Al-Bahar is dead again, oh, hungry. Tonight it is Earth's turn to wrap around itself. Sweet water ebbs who does little to nothing else. Tonight, the tide is aware of me. Only I can tell the water when it's time to go home. Tonight, I become mother-like warm. Habibati, tell me, have you ever had anything as delicious as sleep? Uh, so the next few poems that I want to read are staircase poems, and the title of my pamphlet is called Staircase, and um, by staircase here, if you have ever visited Amman or know anything about it, there are a lot of staircases throughout the city. It's built on hilltops and valleys, so the easiest way to walk through, especially the old city, especially downtown, is to go uh, through staircases. So. Um, yeah, so all of these staircases in the pamphlet, most of them are areas in Amman, um, or they're based on staircases conceptually or actual ones that are in areas of Amman. Um, there are a few that are outside the city as well, and we'll get to that, but this is staircase Jabal al uh, And for this one, you just kind of need to know that Jabal al now is being uh, relentlessly gentrified, and it has been for ages, especially by expats coming into the country, usually Westerners. So this is staircase Zabal al The tourists are taking over the square and I've seen it. Past the Frenchified street lamps and Wallace fountains, I've seen it. By mama's childhood home near Duwar al hawuz I've seen it. The window sign reading Shaqqal al-Ijar for expats only. I've lived my life so far an archive 
of this city. My face, my mother's, mirrored outside its sandstone walls. As the city holds its people differently, as it always has, it stages its streets like an exercise in circumstance, its gaze towards whatever else is west of itself. So that's Staircase Jabal al there. Uh, the next staircase is also based in Amman, and it's in an area called Shmeisani. And what you need to know about this is that Shmeisani in, I wrote this in about 2018, and um, during that time, or I started writing this poem in 2018, and during that time, there were a lot of protests in Amman, and they would start in Shmeisani, the area, and move towards the fourth circle, where the prime ministry is. So this is staircase, Shmeisani. On the way towards the fourth circle, we become vulnerable to the touch of others. An architecture of bodies swarming the streets. Be what feels like a dream, I watch karma yell with the swelling of the crowd around us. These moments, briefer now than they ever were, hold witness to our estrangement to our time spent elsewhere, elsewhering. Witness how many things our city is, Habibi. Empire buzzing against the walls of its jar. And then the last staircase that I wanna read before I move on to a bit of a, a longer poem is uh, based in the Dead Sea. So this is Staircase al Bahr al Mayit or the Dead Sea. Between countries of cloud, freaks of happenstance remain unintelligible. I watch the moon watch me in turn. At times like this, I am tempted to transcend the rules of time. I know I have come too far to fall victim to the eventual swing, the brisk turning of tonight into its tomorrow. Shui shui, I begin to forgive the coldness of winter, its fracture of the personalized dream. According to the study of cardiomyopathy, the end of an era begins to be the top left ventricle. How an orientation of a thousand faults begins by sinking. Here I pay tribute to the system of beliefs. I watch it fall apart in fragments. How when the world assumes the water is dead, I know in reality it is not. See, see how the moon argues against anti-sea propaganda. Now that I've said this, since I am known to be prone to forgetting, I confess I wish I could say that I find this infinitely boring or even infinitesimal. Just kidding, Yalbi, I'm only trying to talk to you. And with that poem taking us out of Amman a little bit, um, I wanna read a long sequence. So I'm asking you all to be patient and to bear with me. Um, I'll try to get through this sort of as quickly as I can so we don't run over time too much. But this is Fairuz is searching for a pair of eyes. And Fairuz is a, is a Lebanese diva. She's really, really big um, in the Middle East. So Fairuz is searching for a pair of eyes, the color of a country. And in the National Gallery of Art, I find hers staring at me from within the body of a new woman, a spectacle of light hot mid conversation. In the limelight nearby, I tell her, we are not entitled to know the body yet. It will escape us like it always does, one foot in front of the other. Elif. To figure a border, I've been told you must first start with the body. In the fresco of a bathing woman, you can see the effect of its creator's breath left on the plaster at the edge of the painting where the edge is purposeful. Unlike Beledi in the 20th century, created almost by accident, 
We know how a single sneeze from the right white nose can cut open a new country. Water spills out of the woman's face like a harvest. Each pigment wet into position. Then I move on. Elif, Elif. They say we owe it to God's country to mark our distance from its beginning. It's unprimed canvas, it's one rosary eye. So while in the Westness, I try to find her a country of our own making, but each museum is a mirror in mourning, each sky a stolen artifact. Homelandless again, I return to our cities and on those same balconies nearby, women ululate their welcome through the air, glistening against the limestone. Elif, Elif, Elif. On my way back from the future, I discover for Fairuz an almost country, a mountain of turquoise cloud hiding in the desert. She asks me to bring it home, but mid-air, it dissolves its architecture. Elif, 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 Elif. Ach, ya elbi. It's almost as if this new Mesopotamia doesn't want to be found. Hiding somewhere in a Madaba-like mosaic, bare in the basement of an unknown church. Still, Fairuz chases the silhouette of its dream on behalf of storms everywhere. Elif, 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 Elif. Dear Mr. Gallery Man, I am lost and have been lost for centuries. The instructions are missing and I am tired. I would like to stop looking by myself for a while. Elif, 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 Elif. Fairuz is searching for a country, the color of a pair of eyes, with the harvest like the dawning of a face. So I draw on her eyebrows with a felt pen. I stretch her skin with total intent. I hope to put all sneezes with their endless consequences behind me. Since it is written that to score the edge of a border first, you must open its figure. First, you start with its eyes. Elif, 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 Elif. Fi mahad fan al fusayfusayi wa tarmim. I ask my instructor how easy it is to forget origins, how difficult it is to restore a whole of fragments to rebuild a body post partition. She says, whatever you do, mosaics are pixelated. You can't ask a tessera to be other than what it is, Yazin. It would do you well to remember. Not every mosaic can be protected from time with burglars. Elif, 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 Elif. In my dream, I'm on Auntie Zane's porch, painting a blue peninsula into the sky named Fairuz. In the near distance, the Dead Sea makes her first appearance, 423 meters above the 60.8 kilometers too close for comfort. Each pillar the old sea brings with it to tight in the garden, right below our family's oldest possession, a country of light drawn fresh with free hand. Elif, Elif, Elif. But these women welcoming us to a home mismade, how they curve the air in the dents of their frame, how among our elders an ergile pipe travels, how the cards are lost slowly, sheikh by sheikh. Elif, elif. Multiple modes of sensation cannot exist without suffering. The old masters, how well they understood of acclamation to the flesh can make itself a master. If the sky changes tone, the brush must charge onwards. Our hands must negotiate the unanticipated one gradual mixture at a time. 
To create art, you must accept the human position. The gradients you cannot change with the flexible wrist. Hold your palette close to the heart of your eyes. Do not forget the canvas begins as a desert, neither of which are blank. The brush, an extension of lightning, ready to make its mark, approach both gently. Trust in their ability to strike in the sand, a sign you did not know you need. Elif. When you asked me what Mahmoud meant when he said, I told you, maybe the moon is not beautiful, except that it is far away. You said translation fit my mouth perfectly. Since then, I've asked the moon to come closer every night or every night. She pretends not to hear me. She turns her face away from me until all I can see is the pure curvature of her neck stretched like a minaret light in the horizon. The rest of her body a faint border in the dark. Ya Qamar, ayuni ilayki tarhalu kulla yawm, wa innani usalli. Thank you, everyone. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Hussein. That was uh, amazing. Um, it was such a pleasure to hear all three of the poets. I'm sorry that the last uh, bit of the slides didn't work out there. But as I say, if you want to read the rest of the poem, you can either look at that link or uh, in the chat or you could buy the pamphlet. Uh, and I hope you will. I hope you will buy uh, all of the pamphlets. Um, they're each is six pounds, but you can buy three for 13 pounds, which sounds like a good deal uh, to me. But then I, I guess I would say that. Uh, thank you to all the poets. Poets, do you want to turn your video back on so everybody can kind of quickly see you if they're looking at the right? version of the screen there we go and katie do you want to flick on your video and uh, we'll give you a virtual or real round of applause thank you very much indeed poets uh, for such a fantastic reading thank you and thank you uh, to les and claire and thank you to everybody here for uh, joining us um if uh you want to find out a bit more about the poets do check out the website uh, there's also three at least two and there'll be another one I think tomorrow, three interviews with the poets that I did uh, if you want to hear more about their thoughts about their pamphlets. But for now, thank you everybody for joining us um, and uh, take care and uh, enjoy reading the poetry. Take care. Thanks a lot. <laughs>